Well, as you can see, Colossians, supremacy, sufficiency, and submission. We're starting a new sermon series here today, and so uh, you, you guessed it right. Open your Bible, the book of Colossians. Chapter 1 is where we're going to be today, and just to kind of give you an idea of what we're doing and where we're going, uh, I'm just going to read the first two verses. We'll be looking at the first eight verses here this morning, but I'll read the first two here in just a moment, and then we'll pray together as we begin our time. But uh, thank you, ladies, for leading us in, in worship through song this morning, and uh, those songs were uh, quite fitting for what we're going to be looking at today, that theme of hope and the gospel and the sufficiency of Christ and Christ alone. Uh, I hope that it was a sweet time for you because it certainly was for me. Uh, listen to what it says, Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren who are in, or in Christ, who are at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. If you're taking notes, the, the thing that I might just uh, share with you to maybe write in your margin is that today that I would pray that we would affirm the gospel of Jesus as solely sufficient for salvation and life. That today, as we launch into this series over the course of the next few months, as we're going to go slow, we're going to take a look at this in very detailed fashion because this is a wonderful, wonderful letter, a wonderful book in our Bible, that we would affirm from the get-go that the gospel of Jesus is solely sufficient for salvation and life. And with that, let me pray for us and we'll jump in. Heavenly Father, I pray that this morning, as we've already had an opportunity to sing about this and to praise you for this, but I pray that this morning that we would see from your word and, and hear from your word what you have provided for us through your son, Jesus. And if you would, where you're at, would you just ask God to, to help you to truly grasp what God our Father has provided for you in Christ. One more thing. Would you just pray? I know there's a lot of things going on in your life like they're going on in mine. That whatever pressing issue on your heart or your mind, would you just give that to Jesus so that you can clearly hear what He has to say? And would you pray for me that I would be a, a help to you and clearly articulate the Word of God here this morning? Well, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, if you'll bear with me, one of the things I'm going to do, so that way you guys can see this later and also people who are watching online that join us on Sunday mornings can also see this. I'm just going to move this over. And Connor, is that in camera? Ish. All right, excellent. Okay, we don't need that for now. That'll be for later, but I just wanted to get that ready, but I also didn't want to just block Lauren as she was singing here this morning. Um, and so, as we dive in, if you're taking notes, I just, this isn't a fancy first point. It's just simply, uh, I titled it Getting to Know You. And as we jump into the study of Colossians, uh, what we find is a typical greeting that Paul would do when he would write a letter to a church. And what I want you to imagine is uh, a church family would receive a letter in the mail, if you would, a courier would would, would uh, deliver this to someone in the life of the church, normally like the pastor or the elder, and then they would take the letter, and they would open it up, and then they would actually, actually I don't think they have envelopes back then, but you know, go with me, uh, they would open it up or unscroll it, and they would begin to read uh, this to the church. And this would have been one of those moments of, guys, you won't believe the letter I got for today. It's from Paul, and it's, he's in Rome. That's where the return at. He's in Rome. I wonder what he's doing there. And what we find is, is Paul is wanting to, to share a letter, but also provide, this is who I am. So if you're curious who's writing this to you, from the get-go, this is who I am. I got my friend Timothy with me as well. But I have an authority to be able to write this to you. Because when when Paul, who is the author of the letter, writes this, he says, I'm an apostle. And there's a lot of different discussion about what is apostle, what is an apostle, what is not an apostle. Just to give you a brief little lesson, the, the term apostle is actually an old shipping term. That's where it actually comes from. It's about a ship that would carry cargo from one nation to another. 
that something of value was being transported or brought uh, to another, another nation. And what it did is it carried this idea of an emissary. That's what an apostle was. It was kind of this emissary, someone who was taking a message from a king, and he was transporting that or carrying that message to you, to deliver that to you. That's what an apostle would be. It's someone saying, this isn't my message. I'm not giving you my message. I'm giving you the message of the king. I'm just the one who's transporting this edict to you because the king wants you to hear this. And this is what Paul is saying. I'm an apostle. I'm an emissary, but not just because I say so, but because God has ordained it. I am an emissary of, if you will, King Jesus, of Christ, Jesus Christ, and remember, Christ is not his last name. It's not Jesus Christ. That's just his title. I'm an I'm a, I'm a emissary. I'm an apostle of Jesus the Christ by the will of God. So the authority that I have to write to you the things that I do is because God has ordained and designed for me to be an emissary of King Jesus to you. And as he does so, what they don't realize until it gets later on, or maybe they get it when they get the letter, is that when it says that he's from Rome, what some people don't realize is when Paul is writing this, he's in chains. He's actually under house arrest in Rome. In fact, Colossians is one of the four letters or books of the Bible, we call them epistles, one of the four epistles that Paul writes where he's actually under house arrest in Rome. And just for you Bible trivia people, the other three are Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and then Philemon. And actually later on, Philemon is very much connected to the book of Colossians. But there are these four letters where Paul, because he has been faithful to the gospel, it has led him to chains. And sometimes we think of this idea, if I'm faithful to God, it will be smooth sailing. Sometimes you get to experience some incredible blessings on this earth. But for Paul, his faithfulness has led him to be enchained, imprisoned, and have to go see Caesar to present his case that he shouldn't be guilty of all the things that he's guilty of. But here's Paul writing this letter in these kinds of conditions, and I love the fact of how, of how he's about to start it. Now, he also says that it's not just me, but it's my uh, little brother in the faith, my son in the faith, uh, Timothy, is also with me. And now that's the author of the letter, but what about the recipients? The recipients, I've mentioned a, a couple of times, are the members of the church in Colossae. And if you were a countryman, if, if Colossae was your city, uh, then you were called a Colossian. So that's why we get the title, the book of Colossians. He's writing to these people. And so as he's writing this, in verse 2, he says, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ. This is the recipients, to the saints, the holy ones, the brethren, those who are set apart in Christ. And I know a lot of times we hear the term saint, and someone will say, well, <laughs> Mother Teresa was the saint, that person was a saint, there's Saint Peter, there's Saint Mark, there's Saint Paul, but those, those are Christians on another tier or level. And I just want to tell you right now, there are no tiers and level of Christianity. There is maturity in Christianity where you mature in your faith, but there are not levels that you aspire to because God doesn't say, if I'm going to give you this much of Jesus, and if you work really hard, then I'm going to give you a little bit more, and you get to level up. That's, that's not the gospel. There is nothing being kept from you. The full counsel, the full word of the gospel is presented to you from the first time you hear it and receive it. You don't have to level up. God has nothing to hide. He doesn't want you to become more enlightened. He just wants you to know Jesus. And He says, you guys in Colossae, you are the faithful ones, the brethren, you are saints. And I just want to remind you that if you in this room, if you're watching online, if you are in Christ, you might not like hearing this because it makes you feel maybe like, ah, I'm not, you are a saint. You have been set apart by the person of Jesus. You are a saint. Do we always behave saintly? Well, I do. I don't know about you. I'm just kidding. No. no. Do we always behave saintly? No. We, we have those moments where we stumble and we fall in this life and we struggle with sin and temptation and whatever it may be. But you've been set apart by Jesus. You are a saint. You are faithful brethren. Now, the church of Colossae uh, would have been predominantly Gentile, but it also would have had a Jewish presence as well. Now, one of the things that I'm most disappointed in myself for this morning is, you know I love maps, and I forgot my map. And so, if you want, I don't know what page it is in your Bible, but my page is probably like, I don't know, 2,000-something. But anyway, in the back of your Bible, uh, there is a, there's pictures of Paul's journeys to Rome. And if, if you could kind of remember with me, when, 
modern-day Turkey is where the church of Colossae, where the city of Colossae would be located. And in modern-day Turkey, there is also a city called Ephesus. And you may remember in our study through the book of Acts that we've been doing over the course of the last two years, and we'll finish next January, um, as we've been journeying through that, Ephesus was a big hub of Paul's ministry, where he spent three years in Ephesus. And he used that as kind of like his central staging ground to get the gospel to go out, as opposed to continuing to travel. He stayed there, and people actually began to come to him. And as you guys remember when we read this morning our scripture reading out of the book of Acts, there came a moment where Paul kind of ceased his travel, set up shop in Ephesus, and he was able to use the school of Tyrannus, kind of this this facility, if you will, to where people were coming in and hearing the gospel in the city of Ephesus, and then they were going out from there with the gospel that they had heard and received. And we believe that one of those individuals that came to the city of Ephesus, sat, if you will, in class at the school of Tyrannus under Paul's teaching, is a guy by the name of Epaphras. And Epaphras is a guy we're going to talk about a little bit later on, but Epaphras hears the gospel, receives the gospel, and then he goes back to his home city of Colossae, and he can't help but share the gospel because he's changed. And as he begins to share the gospel, other people receive, and a church is birthed. A church is formed there in the city of Colossae. Now, when Paul's writing this to this church, there's a reason why he's writing. He's wanting them He's heard from Epaphras that there has been some teaching that has crept up within the life of the church of Colossae that is is not good, Uh, it's going to fester, and it's going to to take away from from what is the true glory of the gospel of Jesus. And and just kind of, if you want to write in your notes, there's just a, a couple of things. One is this idea of asceticism. You're like, what is that? Asceticism is basically rigid self denial. Um, and harsh treatment of your body. Some of you may have known individuals like this of where I have sinned against the Lord or I've done something that I shouldn't, and so I'm going to cut myself or I'm going to hit myself because that will teach me through this physical uh, treatment of my body that I will now refrain from the spiritual uh, distancing or sinning against God. And it was something that was being Uh, that had crept in within the life of the church of this is something that you should do on top of knowing Jesus. Another uh, teaching that had kind of crept in was this idea of Jewish legalism or ceremonialism. Jewish legalism and ceremonialism. And then the third idea that was beginning to creep in was something that is the early, it's not Gnosticism in its full-blown measure, that's going to be a couple hundred years later, but it's the early beginnings of this teaching known as Gnosticism, which is basically the spirit is good, but the flesh is bad. The body is bad. And what it ended up doing was through this teaching, and even here you see it, and we'll see it especially in Colossians 1 and Colossians 2, is that Jesus is not sufficient for you. That you need Jesus, but you know what else you need? You need a little bit of aestheticism. You need a little bit of Jewish ceremony. You need a little bit of Jewish law. You also need a little bit of Greek philosophy. There's these other things that we need to sprinkle in, and as we do so, you're going to tear up. You're going to level up in your walk with the Lord and your understanding of God. And Jesus, or excuse me, Paul, is not about to have any of that. So what he wants to do is he wants to teach them the truth remind them of the true gospel. But before he does that, I love that Paul says, before I do that, let let me finish my greeting to you with grace to you and peace from God our Father. And as I do so, I'm going to to present to you some good news. Uh, One of the things that I even have staring in front of me that that, that is so fun is, have you ever received a letter in the mail or recently? There's something just so fun about that. Um, normally, what we get in the mail is junk mail or a bill, and that's, that's really about it. Occasionally, we might get a card, and it's, it's kind of fun to see something different than junk mail or a bill. And there's, uh, there's a young lady who is about 10 years old, I think. Um, her name is Katie, and two years ago, two years ago, June, no, 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 2021 June, uh, 
She and her family, they were friends of ours, the couple, uh, her mom and dad, uh, are friends of ours from seminary that we went with in Fort Worth. And so they came and they visited our home last June for the Southern Baptist Convention. They wanted to spend some time with us, kind of catch up. And uh, the parents, uh, TJ and Meredith, they brought their four children into our home and uh, one child found a remote and put it in the toilet. That's what they do. And it was just, it was a fun time getting to hang out with the kids. And then I really got to talk with this girl, Katie. She was about 9, 10, 11, somewhere in that range. And as we got to talking, I found out that she's a big Star Wars fan. And I was like, well, I'm a big Star Wars fan. Let's talk about Star Wars. And I kid you not, from that time on, it's been over a year now, uh, Tiffany and myself and Katie, we have corresponded for, I don't know, maybe five, six times over the course of the year. And she has just the uncanny ability to be able to write just so, so kindly, but also very funny. And whenever we receive this in the mail, we're so excited of, we got a letter from Katie and it's going to be fun and it's going to be funny and it's going to talk about Star Wars and we're going to get to know how she's doing and all the things that she's enjoying. There's just something sweet about receiving a letter. And what I love about when we read these books of the Bible that Paul writes, or that John writes, or that Peter writes, is sometimes we turn our Bible into a textbook, when what you really need to do is you need to turn the book of Colossians into a letter. You need to take the letter, and I would encourage you to do this. Over the course of the next few months, we're going to be in Colossians going slow, but read the book of Colossians in its entirety once a week. I think it takes you like, if you read from verse 1 of chapter 1 to the end of chapter 4, it would take you probably 15 minutes, 12 minutes to read this. You're like, I don't have time to read. You don't have 12 minutes to read. And this is what will happen, is if you will read this once a week for the next few months, you will know the Word. And you'll actually begin to dream about the Word. Like, you won't be able to get away from it. You've all experienced this. A year ago, I was getting trained for the job that I went back to work at, and I learned a lot of new stuff. You ever gone through training at a new job, and you're just immersed with all this new stuff, so much so that you can't stand it, and you go to bed, and you can't stop dreaming about it? You're like, I can't get away from this thing. I want you to not get away from Colossians. For, for, for me, there's a lot of scripture that I love. Colossians is probably my favorite book of the Bible. I just, I just love the book of Colossians. I feel like it can, it can speak to you in pretty much any aspect of your life. Like, is, is God's Word going to speak to me in, in my everyday to day life? Colossians will speak to you. But don't treat it as a textbook. Treat it as a letter that you've received from a dear friend. And you're like, I can't wait to hear what you have to say. My grandparents, man, they would do that. Uh, they married right before my grandfather left to go overseas for World War II. And they would write to each other. And my grandmother would speak about how she would read the letter. And she would keep it, but she would read it again. And she would read it again. And she would read it again. Because she wanted to hear from her loved one. I mean, Paul's like our big brother. Let's listen to what he has to say. And see if your life doesn't change from stress and anxiety to, you know what? Christ is sufficient. He is supreme. Yeah, that financial issue, that relationship issue, it's ever-present. But man, look at what I have in Christ. And this is what he does to begin with. Um, uh, uh, we're going to read verses 3 through 8, and what you're going to find is this is a long run-on sentence. Paul gets so excited sometimes, he's just like, and this, and this, and this, and this, to where I'm going to try to read it in one breath. I don't think it's going to happen, but we're going to read verses 3 through 8, and we're just going to see how Paul is just say, saying, basically, I have some good news that I want to share with you, and some good news I want to remind you of before we get into, here's some truth that you need to hear, and some things you need to flee from, where he starts using kind of that ap ap apostolic authority. So, Colossians 1, verse 3, look at what it says. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. I'm not going to make it. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel which has come to you, just as in all the world also it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing, even as it has been doing in you also since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God and truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow bondservant, who is a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf. And he also informed us of your love in the Spirit. Paul is excited, and he's grateful for what they have 
And that's what I want us to focus our time on this morning, is point number two is we give thanks for your faith. Verse three, he says, we give thanks to God, the Lord of our, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith. We give thanks for your faith and we pray for you always. And the thanks isn't just this ethereal idea of we give thanks for you. He's saying we give thanks for you and the object of our thankfulness, our gratitude is God, is God the Father. And he says, I want to begin this letter with some good news that we would be grateful for what we have in Jesus. And this is what I want to kind of hit you guys with. So look at me. I know that you can watch the news or you can look at your own life and go, oh, life is hard. It is. It was never promised to be easy, ever. But don't forget what you have in Christ. And what I want to do with that is we tend to go to one of two extremes with this idea. We can go to the one extreme of where it's like, be real, be authentic. And someone, you know that individual that you come up to and every time you visit with them, they're like, you know, how are you doing? And they're just like Debbie Downer, like, well, you know, my, my, my car's in the ditch and my dog got cancer and my aunt died and da, da, da. And it's like, whoa, that's a lot of information. And you're being real and authentic, but it's just every time, is there anything that you're thankful for? And then there's the other extreme of where you're like, man, how are you doing? I've, I've heard you got a, a rough diagnosis and your aunt died and your dog got hurt and your car's in the ditch. And you're like, Jesus is good. I'm all good, man. Everything's fine. And you're like, you're, you're going to snap on someone one day. I'm nervous to be around you right now because you're not being authentic and real that it's okay to say it's not okay. But somewhere of not going to one pendulum swing or the other is a biblical center of saying, authentically, this is hard and it hurts. And I, I'm, on, I'm struggling, but I do know at the foundation and core of who I am, what I have in Christ, that I am grateful. Even in the midst of tears streaming down my face, I am grateful. Even in the midst of where I'm struggling with worry or anxiety, I'm still, I know I'm grateful. And Paul is saying, man, give thanks for what you know that you have. Take the time to express your gratitude. And even the idea of being thankful, I was thinking about this, is I've I've been around people because we, as Americans, we celebrate Thanksgiving, and I've done the thing, you've done the thing around the table of what are you thankful for? And uh, it, it's fun, I think, to be able to share that. I'm thankful for my family, uh, I'm, I'm thankful for my good health, and all those things, but those are things that you're thankful for, but who are you expressing your gratitude to? And, and I, I've, I've been around people who, who they'll express, ah, man, I'm just so thankful, and it's like, for what and to whom? And sometimes we have this idea, well, I'm just thankful. I'm thankful to, I don't know, the cosmos. I'm thankful to Mother Earth, or I'm thankful to, you know, the, the, the positive energy out there. And it's like, everything that you've just told me is in, impersonal. And if something is impersonal, it does not care for you, and it does not think of you. But we have a creator God who is not impersonal. He is very personal with you. He thinks of you. He sees you. He knows you. And so we do indeed have someone to be thankful for in what we've been able to experience. And so Paul says, man, we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm praying for you always since I've heard of your faith. I heard one guy say, well, Paul, shouldn't you have been praying for them anyway? I mean, you're Paul. You should just be praying all the time. Just pray for them. And it's like, well, one, get off your, your, your self-righteous high horse. Two, what Paul is doing is he's heard from Epaphras of a group of people he's never heard of before who have heard the faith and come into the family. And now that he knows, he is thankful for them. And he's like, and now you're on my prayer list. Because there's something different about praying generally for people and praying specifically for someone. It's kind of like before, Doug would tell me about the DR, and I would be like, I'll pray generally for them, but now that I've seen them, I pray specifically for them. I can pray even for the street where the fourth refugio is at. I can pray for some of the neighbors that I've met there, the pastor that I've met there. It's in the same way that if, if you're uh, maybe a distance away and someone comes to you and says, hey, 
I want you to know that your brother or sister, their family, they welcomed a new addition into this world. You have a niece, you have a nephew, you have a, you have a cousin, whatever it may be. And it's like, oh, I didn't know that. But now that I do, I'm excited and thankful we have a new addition to the family. They're going in my prayer list. I'm going to pray for them because now I've heard that you're a part of the family. And so one of the things I would encourage you to do, this is just a, a, a personal thing that I've done that I don't remember who, who passed this on to me. But, but years ago, I began to write in the back of my Bible, specifically some other pastors and friends that I know, and I'd write their names down and pray for them. I think this was in seminary because the t- statistics of the number of men who went into seminary to be a pastor and 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years later are no longer in the pastorate for a variety of different reasons. And so I would encourage you to take the time that when you know of someone, man, add them to your prayer list and put it with your Bible so that way you're not like, who's on that list? Well, you, hopefully you have your Bible handy and it's around and you can begin to pray for them. The other thing that he says is, I pray for you and I'm grateful for you because of your faith. And I lost Colossians when I decided to go back into the back of my Bible. Um, so this idea of faith, what is faith? And I'm just going to read this to you. Faith is to be persuaded that something is true and to trust in it. It's far more than just mere intellectual assent. It involves obedience. It's this idea of who or what is the object of your faith. And for them, the object of their faith is in Christ. Our faith is secure in the way that a house is secure on a solid foundation. When you have genuine faith... Our faith is our belief, and when you believe something, you act upon it. I'll give you an example. I've told you before that when I was in high school and college, I really enjoyed rock climbing. But before I got into rock climbing, I learned how to rappel. And I've always enjoyed rappelling. And the reason why I thought of this is because Tiffany and I, we've been watching some like survival shows of where uh, Bear Grylls will take someone and they'll go rappelling and that kind of thing. And so I, I'm like, that looks fun. Tiffany's like, no thank you. But for me... I have a a trust, maybe too much so, I have a trust in the harness, I have a trust in the rope, I have the trust in the carabiner, I have the trust in tying that figure eight knot and double backing and making sure that it's good to go. Like, I trust those things to where over the course of my life, uh, the first time I learned how to rappel, it was off a 12-foot bridge, and then me and my buddies went to an 80-foot rappel out in the middle of Arkansas, Arkansas, and uh, it it was fantastic. And ever since then, I've always enjoyed the opportunity to rappel because I just tend to trust those things that I'm attached to. And because I trust it, I'm willing to hold the rope, hold the rope, and just lean back. And this was something that was said in this show so many times. you got to trust the rope and lean back. You don't want to just kind of barely kind of scoot out. You want to lean back and trust it. But here's the thing. Your faith is as strong as what you trust in. If you don't trust in it, your faith is weak and you will not repel down that cliff. But if your faith and trust in that rope and in the security of how it's been tied and the knots and all the gear, then you will lean back with your life dangling 80 to 150 feet up in the air and you will repel down that rock cliff. Same is true with, with our relationship with the Lord. Our faith produces action. And sometimes what people will say, and this was something that was coming along in the church of Colossae, was like, no, 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 what you really need is is do these things, do these things, and then you'll have faith, and then you'll be enlightened, and then you'll level up. And what Paul is wanting to say is, no, 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 no. Your faith is in Christ and Christ alone, and because you trust in Him, that will produce within you action, that will produce within you conduct and behavior that is becoming of the Lord. We even see that their faith produced within them a love, the end of verse 4, a love which they have for all the saints. If your faith in Christ is true and genuine, it will produce a love for your brothers and sisters in Christ. On our website, we have just this little motto, this little moniker of love God, love people, proclaim Christ. We didn't just make that up. It comes from Scripture. But it's this idea of loving God is first in priority because if I love God, I trust God, my faith is in God, what it should produce is a love for others. And the way in which I'm going to ultimately demonstrate that love is I'm going to proclaim to them the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the first thing that he gave thanks for. Paul also says, number three, we give thanks for the hope. I'm not going to be able to tarry for this one, but verse 5, he says here, 
We've prayed for you because of the faith that we've heard, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. This faith and this love is because of the hope that is laid up for you in heaven. The Bible will speak about the idea of hope in two different ways. One is an internal feeling of hope, and we kind of understand that, this, this internal feeling of hope. But the Bible can also speak of an external reality of what you're hoping in. It's not an internal feeling, but it's an external reality of what's going on or what you're hoping in. And for us, our faith and love in Christ and the hope that we have for us laid up for in heaven is both internal and external. Internally, I know whom I have believed and persuaded that he will keep what I have given to him until that day. So I have this hope, but it's not just an internal thing, it's an external truth and reality that this is going to happen, that the message of the gospel of Jesus, that He's come to give you a relationship with God, and the hope of that is secure forever. Again, I come back to this. Are you giving thanks and are you recognizing what God has provided for you in Christ? Or are we so focused on the other obstacles in this life that are big and glaring, that we missed the bigger truths of hope and faith and love that you have in Christ through the gospel. So we give thanks for the hope. Number four, we give thanks for the gospel. The gospel specifically, or the gospel in the the pronoun it, is mentioned multiple times just in these few verses. It seems to be the heart of what Paul is getting at. He says in verse 5, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel. The gospel is truth, and it's a message, it's a word that has been declared and delivered. I want to read to you a quote from theologian R.C. Sproul. Um, He has gone to be with the Lord, but I just want to read this to you. Uh, it's, It's a long quote, so I think we have it on the screen, yeah. But I just want you to follow along and listen to what he says. He says, the great misconception in our day is this, that God isn't concerned to protect his own integrity. He's kind of a wishy-washy deity who just waves a wand of forgiveness over everybody. No. For God to forgive you is a very costly matter. It costs the sacrifice of his own son. So valuable was that sacrifice that God pronounced it valuable by raising him, Jesus, from the dead so that Christ died for us. He was raised for our justification. So the gospel is something objective. It is the message of who Jesus is and what he did. That is the gospel, objectively. And it also has a subjective dimension. How are the benefits of Jesus subjectively appropriated to us? How do I get it? The Bible makes it clear that we are justified not by our works, not by our efforts, not by our deeds, but by faith and by faith alone. The only way you can receive the benefit of Christ's life and death is by putting your trust in Him and Him alone. You do that, you're declared just by God. You're adopted into His family, you're forgiven of all your sins, and you have begun your pilgrimage for eternity. The gospel is good news. Have you forgotten it? When's the last time that you thanked God, not for the food today, don't, don't, we do that a lot. We, we, we pray, go, thank you for the day. Thank you for this food. Thank you for my family. When's the last time you thanked God for the gospel? Thanked God for the hope that you have. Thanked God for the faith that you have, the forgiveness that you have. Because it's the greatest news of Jesus' victory over Satan, sin, and death. And he says to them, the same way that you receive the gospel is how they receive the gospel. We can't go super into it, but you can see it in verse 5 and 6. They heard it, it came to them, and they understood it. They understood the grace of God in truth. And what I love is Paul says this gospel is not only personal to you, but he says it not only came to you, which is great news for you, but it's available to everybody. He says you have heard it, but just as in also all the world it's, it's, it's not just for you. You're not the center of Christianity. You're not the center of the gospel. You get to be a recipient of the gospel in the same way that the person next to you does and your enemy does and the person that looks nothing like you does and the person on the other side of the world does. The gospel is for all. 
And when you receive that gospel, you hear the word of truth, you understand the word of truth, you receive the gospel into your life by faith in Christ, it bears fruit and it increases. That, that should be something that we see in our life, that not that we are growing and having different tier levels of our walk with the Lord, but that we are growing and maturing in the Lord and that we are sharing our faith and that we see people also hearing the word of truth, receiving the word of truth because they understand it, that we would proclaim it to those that are around us. And just on a personal level, I love the fact that Paul bookends this kind of little midsection of what the gospel is with, you heard the word of truth, and at the very end of verse 6, the grace of God in truth. It's all about the truth. And we're in a day and a time where truth has become more and more relative, that I can determine what truth is. You're not the arbiter of truth. God is, is the one that declares what the truth of the matter is. We hear what he has to say. Number five, we give thanks for Epaphras, verses seven and eight. You might ask, well, who is Epaphras? Well, what we find out is that he heard the gospel, he shared the gospel, and he planted the church in Colossae. We also find that he's a fellow worker of the gospel of Jesus with Paul, but he's also a prisoner, we find, in the book of Philemon. What many believe is that he came to visit Paul in Rome. Paul was in prison in Rome under house arrest, and then as Epaphras was probably ministering in Rome, he too got thrown into prison as well. So it's believed that Epaphras is probably in prison with Paul, and as this is happening, Epaphras is telling Paul all about the church of Colossae, the good and some of the struggles, some of the bad that's crept within the life of the church, and Paul is just moved to where I need to talk to them. I need to write a letter to them to let them know, I know who you are, I see you, You're, it's personal, I care about you, and I want to I talk to you, I want to encourage you. Because what had happened, what Epaphras shares with him, that we'll see explicitly in chapters 1 and 2, is that though they came to faith in Christ, rooted in Jesus, the false teaching began to creep up. And what happened was, a lot of people, and this is true for us today before we throw stones at the church of Colossae, a lot of people when they receive something new, they want to advance, they want to progress, they want to grow in it. And so they begin to ask the question, perhaps, of how does this happen? Some began to take this idea of, I have faith in Jesus, and saying, hmm, this is good, but let's combine this also good teaching from Greek philosophy, or this Jewish idea of some ceremony or some legal law that we need to keep up with, and we'll mingle it and we'll mix it together. And this is where I get to do a little cooking show. So this is some, uh, some chocolate cake mix, and we're going to put that in there. And then uh, I'm doing kind of a half thing. And so we got an egg. We're going to put that in there. And then please don't get on me. Um, and then I'm probably going to have to add a little bit more of this to kind of get it going. But I have a marker. And what happens is, is the gospel <laughs> overdid it just a tad, and a little bit of this, maybe a little more. Um, oh man, I am just greasy now. If you don't know this about me, I don't like getting my hands sticky. Um, so, where did it go? Oh, here it is. So, what you have is, you, you have the gospel, and it's, getting, it's, it's got everything that it needs in it, just like this delicious cake mix. It's got everything that you need in it for, uh, for truth, for hope, for life, for love. And this is what's been offered to them. They, they, they've been presented it. They've heard it. They received it. They understand it. They know that they're saved by grace and grace alone. But as can happen in our life, and I've seen this happen with people who have heard the gospel, especially at a young age, or maybe even in high school, and they get to college and they start hearing some other ideas. Or they get really smart and educated and they get too good for their, too smart for their own business. And what they begin to do is they think, well, what I'm going to do is, man, this is good, but I want to continue to grow in advance. And if I really want to do that, there's some things within the culture that are a little bit like, that's old fashioned, that's antiquated. And if I really want to know that my eternity is secure and I want to advance to the next level, I got to add a few things into this. And so what happened was in the life of the church, Things were being added that maybe weren't altogether bad. Like our, our Jewish brothers and sisters, they had some great things, but that's not what it was designed to be. And so in the same way that toothpaste is really good for you, 
If you put that in there, oh, the cap's still on. It's really good for you, but if you add that in there as well, then what you're going to have is kind of an interesting concoction of, uh, you know, minty, refreshing, but not exactly what you need. And you're like, you know, I need some, some medicine, some daily vitamins, so I'm going to put some vitamins in there as well, kind of crunch those up. And you're like, that's not bad, but you start just adding some more stuff, and then you're like, you know, seasonal allergies are really bad, and so we're going to get some of that in there. And then you're like, if, if you're American, you like mustard, and so then you just start adding some mustard in there. And this is the thing, is these things maybe by themselves aren't all that bad, but when you add it to a cake mix, you're sick, and it's just gross, and it's just weird. And then I know there's some of you who are like, I'll, I'll try it. It'll be delicious. So, shh, just go. Um, and it's one of those things of where it's like, that, that's not good. <clears throat> and, I, and I realize that there are things that have been added to the gospel that are actually deadly to you. I, I didn't bring them with me, but uh, I was going to bring like some nuts and bolts and just add those in there as well of... Those are great for construction. Those are great to be able to do that job, but it has nothing to do with the gospel. The gospel is sufficient because Jesus is sufficient in everything that he accomplished on this life, on this er- in his life on this earth, and on the cross and his resurrection from the grave. When we add to it, we actually make it disgusting and we muddle it up and we confuse people because they taste this and they're just like, That's not the gospel. That's just not the gospel. But unfortunately, sometimes tastes can begin to become changed, and you're like, I guess that's just the gospel now. I guess that's just what it is. And I think there are a lot of people, that was awful. Um, I think there are a lot of people that are friends of yours or family members of yours, and what frightens me is they think that the gospel isn't enough. What also frightens me is if the gospel is in you, if the the faith that you have in Jesus is real and genuine, why is it not producing anything in your life? And what I mean by that is, again, we're not saved by works, but what you believe you will put into action. That's just a fact. If I trust in that rope, I'm going to lean back and I'm going to descend that mountain cliff. If I believe in Jesus, my life is going to have actions that look like I believe in Jesus. Not out of legalism, but out of love of what I know I have. And so, that toothpaste was the worst. Um, <laughs> and so, I share this with you for, for a couple of reasons. Is one, I'm so grateful that there was a man by the name of Epaphras that went into a community and shared what he knew. And and I want you to write this question down. There's two questions. In your life, who was your Epaphras? Who was your Epaphras? Was it a parent? Was it a pastor? Was it a brother or sister? Was it a friend? Like, who was your Epaphras that presented to you the gospel and you understood And by the grace of God, you placed your faith. And if you can identify who that person is, if they're still living, express gratitude to that person. And sometimes we get self-conscious with that, of like, I don't don't know if I could possibly, that will be weird, I haven't talked to that person in so long, or, oh, it's my parents. uh." You will make their day if you go home and text or call that person and just say, hey, Thank you for being faithful with the gospel. The second question is, are you being an Epaphras? Epaphras was not Paul. (laughs) Obvious pastor. Yeah, he wasn't Paul. Sometimes we compare ourselves to some of these people that we read in Scripture. And again, they're just men. They're just women. But they took their faith seriously, and they moved with action because of their faith. And in the same way that you're grateful for that Epaphras in your life, by the grace of God, someone could be grateful that you would be the Epaphras in their life. Not that you can save them, but you can 
present the gospel to them and have conversation with them and ask them questions so that they could hear it, understand it, receive it, and then they will share it. Uh, can we put that last scripture up, Chris, Romans 10? This is a, a scripture that you guys have seen and heard and read many times, but it says, For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in Him in whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. And we read that, and I've had some people in the life of the church tell me, oh, but it's talking about a preacher. You're the keruso. That's the Greek word. You're the proclaimer. It's not resigned to Paul, the apostle, or Peter, the apostle, or Epaphras, this church planter. It's assigned to all of us as ambassadors of reconciliation that we would proclaim this truth. So I want to, what I want to close with here this morning is this, is if you're watching online, if you're in the room and you're just like, is this what I have in Christ? Is this what I know to be true? Or have I added anything? My question is, do you know Him? Because Jesus is our message. He's our hope. He's the object of our faith. He's our life. And the best thing that any of us could offer you today is Him. Do you know Him? And if in this room or online you're watching, if you know Him, can I tell you, stick with Him advance with Him. Because what they're teaching in some uh, in, in this area that they're fighting against is they're saying, you started with Jesus, but now you need to kind of go on from Jesus. Allow Jesus to be the one that you start with, you stick with, and you grow with Him. Not from Him, but with Him. And allow, as He's going to say in Colossians 2, the, the roots of your faith in Jesus to sink deep, that all of your growth and advancement is going to come in and through Him. And my hope is that the way that we could begin that in our series in Colossians is that with that piece of paper that you have there in your seat is I want to just, I just want to encourage you. We're going to just listen to, we're not going to have a song. We're just going to have some music that's going to play. And if you guys want, go ahead and, go ahead and play that. We're just going to have some music being, being played uh, on the speakers just so it's not awkwardly silent for you. But what I want to ask you to do is with a pen and that paper is I want to ask you to answer this question of what are you thankful for? And before you begin to write it down, don't be general. Just like a few weeks ago, we identified what we were fearful of, and I said, be specific. Same thing here. What are you thankful for? Be specific. If you're, I'm thankful for God, but what about God? That's, I'm thankful for God. It's too broad. What about God? I'm thankful for Jesus. What about Jesus? What are you what are you thankful for? In a life and a time and a culture where we can focus on a lot of the bad news and things that are out there when we pull up our phones or we watch the news, Paul's reminding us we have much to be thankful for. And what I would ask you to do is, is as you write that and just kind of have a time of just music playing, is there's probably plenty of paper around you that's extra. What I would just invite you to do, because it would encourage my soul, write down what you're thankful for on a piece of paper, write down that same list on another piece of paper, and just, just bring that piece of paper and put it in the offering plate. As we've done before, I want to pray over those tomorrow morning, first thing before I clock in for work. And it would just be, as a pastor, just so encouraging to know there's a lot of needs we need to pray for, but what are you thankful for specifically? Keep one in your Bible, but present one up here as just kind of an offering to the Lord of, here's what I'm thankful for, and then I'm going to take those tomorrow morning and just say, God, here is what we, as Mission Point, we are thankful for this. And we got specific. We didn't just say, oh, I'm thankful for my family. Why are you thankful for your family? The goal is not to be general. The goal is to be specific. Just take a few moments and we'll be done.